Hey everybody, welcome to a video on the Constructive Criticism YouTube channel, uh, as well as PureMTGO.com. This is Wednesday Night Warrior, and I'm Spencer. And today, we're going to do a deck tech and a little bit of a tournament report. So I've been gone for a few weeks. Uh, I have a pregnant wife who happened to get kidney stones and had a rough couple of weeks, but I'm back. And in, in the downtime, I actually went and won TCG Player States with an Etherworks Marvel deck that we're going to get a chance to talk about today. A little bit of a spicy sideboard. And uh, just do a little deck tech and talk a little bit about the tournament and uh, why I think the deck is actually really good. Um, despite <laughs> the people's hatred for the deck, I, I actually think the deck is a really good choice right now. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to talk about it and, and about you know what you can do with the deck and and uh, some of your options to uh, combat the things that people are trying to do to stop you. So uh, we're going to go over the main deck really quick. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, so we have four Etherworks Marvel... Two glass blowers puzzle knot, uh, three hedron archive, four wood weavers puzzle knot. Then our creatures are four drowner of hope, one ember cool, uh, four servant of the conduit, uh, four ulamog the ceaseless hunger. We have uh, our removal is four ether meltdown. Um, we then have uh, two chandra flame collar, uh, four attune with ether, and then we have twenty four lands. We have four ether hub. Uh, four evolving wilds, seven forests, three islands, two mountains, and four spire bluff canals. Um, so the main deck is is pretty interesting comparatively, um, with things like Hedron Archive, and Drowner of Hope, and uh, Servant of the Conduit. Our deck is very different from the all in combo Etherworks Marble decks. The main difference is that we can actually cast our Emrakuls and our Ulamogs through a ramp strategy. Um, not only that, but against control decks, we have Chandra and Drowner of Hope as very castable threats against them to tax their counter spells, um, you know, for so that we can resolve one of our cheaper threats in Etherworks Marvel. Um, so let's let's uh, let's talk about the best creature in the deck. So the best creature in the deck is actually Drowner of Hope. Uh, you know, putting in those two one ones. Uh, it's seven power for six mana, uh, split up between multiple bodies, and you know it it stops the mid rangey decks from attacking us. Uh, it stops the aggressive decks from attacking us, uh, and, and it, you know it just buys you so much time. And it, you know one of the greatest interactions in the deck is actually the fact that when you sacrifice the tokens, you get more energy if you have an Etherworks Marvel in play. So, you know, it's actually a really good hit off of your Aetherworks Marvel because oftentimes it'll either give you enough mana to cast maybe one of the big threats you have stranded in your hand, or it'll give you enough energy to just reactivate Aetherworks Marvel, uh, you know, with some puzzle knots that you have left in play or things like that. And even if it doesn't, it's, you know, seven power in play, and that's a lot. Uh, it, it Overall, the card just does everything that the deck is really missing with those all-in combo versions. And because of that, you know, I, I think that that's why... If you ask me, I have such a very different opinion of Etherworks Marvel than other people. Because when we originally tested the deck for the Pro Tour, we had the all-in combo version. And to be completely honest, it wasn't very good. Uh, we actually didn't think anyone would play it at the Pro Tour. Well, we were very wrong. Um, but no one's played it since the Pro Tour because of, in my opinion, how bad that all-in version is. Uh, and, and this version with Drowner of Hope and Hedron Archive that allow you to really cast your threats and, and do different things has really been helpful to the strategy overall. Um, so what is the most interesting, you know, what is the best spell in the deck, you could say? Well, that's pretty easy. It's Aetherworks Marvel. Uh, the card just is so easy to get back to six energy in this deck and get three to five activations a game out of this card. Um, you know, oftentimes people are like, oh, well, you just miss sometimes, and it's like, well, that's why I'm playing four Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, because in reality, Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot is really not a miss. It's actually just another activation, and a lot of life to get you back to activating again. Um, so against even the aggressive decks, you know, this is a pretty decent hit, where you can, you know, hit this, activate it again, you're up six life, and you have another hit to try and get to your, you know, your Ulamog, or in this deck against those aggro decks, Chandra. Uh, Chandra's the next card that I want to talk about. Uh, you know, with so many spell callers running around, you'll have people like, you know, jamming their spell callers in against your Marvel. And in the thing that this deck does, and something that Michael talked about on our last podcast, is it really forces those blue white decks to really have all of it. They need spell queller and spellful spirit and Avacyn. You know, they have to and Gideon to really like punish you. And 
in those games, yeah, you're going to lose those games. But the truth is, is that everyone's going to lose those games against those decks, not just you. Uh, and, and that's one of the benefits that this deck has is that it, like other decks, does force them to have all of it at times, uh, which is a huge benefit If in at the end of the day. And Aether works in this deck. It's so easy because of the fact that Drowner gives you so much mana and also gives you energy uh, and, you know, having more Woodweaver's Puzzle Knots. It's just easy to get lots of activations out of it. And let's be honest, like, uh, it also gives you a lot of choices. You know, when to activate this card is something that's really interesting in this deck because of things like Chandra. Uh, so the uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is, is really the mana curve. Something that uh, is something that I don't think people see when they look at this deck. Actually, the fact that you have a turn two Servant of the Conduit to put you into turn three Aetherworks Marvel. This is important because this actually gets you past Spell Queller on the play or, you know, Wood Chatter on the play. This means that you can have a Marvel before they even have counter magic. Uh, a lot of the control decks, you know, the people that are playing like Esper and Jeskai, a lot of times they don't even have three mana on turn three anyway because of how many tap lands they're playing. And because of that, you're able to get your Marvel down a lot of the time anyway, especially against the Esper decks. Not as often against the Jeskai decks, but, you know, if they're, you know, spending things to kill your Servant of the Conduit or, you know, whatever it may be, they're just, you know, they're, it means that, that, that they'll never have a, you know, Harness Lightning to, to get your Drowner of Hope late in the game and things like that. So, Servant of the Conduit is, is secretly the thing that makes this mana curve really work. Uh, you know, between a Tomb of Ether and Glass Blowers, or uh, what do we use Puzzle Knot and Servant of the Conduit, you have a lot of early spells to let you do things. Um, one of the complaints that a lot of people have with the Marvel deck is that 4 Emrakul, 4 Ulamog feeling where it's like, I just draw hands and they have, you know, Emrakuls and Ulamogs and then I have to mulligan. It's like, yeah, but this deck only plays 5 total and the rest of the spells are actually really castable and you actually have like a decent backup ramp strategy. Um, so my, my favorite interaction in the deck is, is gotta be, you know, the Drowner of Hope plus plus Aetherworks Marvel. Being able to slow them down, tap down their guys, while building up energy and getting more activations is really sweet. Something else that is pretty sweet is activating Marvels and like hitting Drowner of Hopes, your opponent doesn't want to use things like, you know, like their, their um, the four mana counter spell that, that exiles things. They don't want to use those spells on Drowner of Hope because what happens if you drop an Ulamog after that Drowner, you know, after your first Drowner, how, whatever it may be. So oftentimes they'll, they'll let Drowners resolve and like they shouldn't, but they don't know what your deck consists of. And it's just so different than the other Marvel's decks that it, there's a lot of advantage to playing a deck like this right now. Uh, you know, I think that let's go over the sideboard now, because now, now we've gone over the main deck and my opinions of it. Uh, and the sideboard is really spicy. So we have uh, two Bristling Hydra, three Long Tusk Cub, two Negate, three Radiant Flames, one Plains, and four Spell Queller. So uh, as you'll notice, I have four Evolving Wilds in this deck, as well as four Tune with Aether, um, four Aether Hub, and uh, even four uh, Servant of the Conduit. So we actually have a lot of ways to generate white mana in the deck post-board. Um, so many that I decided to try Spellcaller, specifically because of how many Gideons you expect to see post-board with this deck, because it's probably the best card against you. Um, and if you're able to Spellcaller their Gideon, untap, and then play a threat of your own, uh, as well as while you're pressuring them with Long Tusk Cubs, a lot of times you are just a different deck than they're expecting to play against post-board. Not only... Are you a different deck, like, in the form, like, you have creatures that they, like, should be killing, but also your strategy is different. Um, you know, you're this, you're this beatdown deck that, like, can go, that has an insane long game with things like Drowner of Hope and Chandra, um, and Spell Queller really gives you the, this way to stop Gideon that you really wouldn't have outside of, like, Negates. The other thing that, that these three creatures do, these Long Tusk Cubs, these Bristling Hydras, and these Spell Quellers, is there's so many people that just think all they need against you is Ceremonious Rejection, and these cards that you have in your deck, such as Chandra, you know, this threat in your deck that's not colorless, that is a, represents a very big clock, and that you're really happy to wheel post board to get you more threats, they don't do it. Ceremonious Rejection doesn't do anything against you, uh, and that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, overall, I, I would say that the sideboard plan... 
against those post, you know, against those decks is really shown, you know, how how you have to think outside of the box sometimes to beat those bad matchups. A lot of people will just give up on a deck. They'll be like, well, there's no way you could ever beat this deck on paper. And they don't, like, dig in and figure out, well, okay, how is this deck beating me? And how can I, in turn, turn that good matchup, this bad, bad matchup, into a good matchup? And this transformative sideboard actually really helps you against those Gideon decks, uh, you know, with Spell with spell Queller and and, uh, and even Long Tusk Cub is, you know, something, it's amazing and it's aggro, being able to, you know, play, a, play it early, uh, you know, maybe after a, uh, a Tomb with Ether, you know, make it a 3-3 three, three, and it's already bigger than most of their stuff. And if you can get one attack into it, get it to be a 4-4, four, four, you know, they're in pretty big trouble. Uh... You know, one of the things that a lot of these decks are playing is they're playing Kozilek's Return. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback that I got is how bad the front side of Kozilek's Return is. And I mean, obviously, Radiant Flames doesn't have that problem. In fact, the decks that you want Kozilek's Return against usually are just those hyper-aggressive decks. And usually, Radiant Flames just does a little bit of a better job in those matchups. Uh, you know, it, it really get. I mean, and, you know, it, it just wipes the things with three toughness. Uh, that you might care about. I, there was a there was a match where I was playing against a guy with Hanwar Garrison. He was playing like red white humans, and I was or Hanwar Battlement. Oh, I don't know which one's which, but he was playing the the two three, and I was very glad to have Radiant Flames in those games. Um, you know, and then I had another game at the tournament where you know people were playing like the Fairgrounds Warden, and that has three toughness. So it, it's it's pretty important, I think, that to be able to wipe a board clean with something like this especially with people you know some of the aggressive decks playing things like reflector mage so um overall i pretty happy with the deck you know when when i think back on states is the which is the tournament that i won with the deck uh you know i actually just played against nothing but spell queller all day uh in fact if you go to the the uh the utah the page with the with the decks um you will actually see um, you know, it, first place was me with Etherworks Marvel. Second place, the deck that I beat in the finals was Blue White Flash. Um, third place was Jeskai Control, which I had to beat. Um, and then uh, there was another Blue White Flash deck. Uh, Red White Vehicles, Blue White Panharmonicon. That deck was crazy interesting. Uh, Black White Midrange and Jeskai Control. Um, I played against uh, I played against uh, Spell Queller literally every single round but one. That tournament, um, I think that the idea that you just can't beat a card is how formats get stagnant, and I hope that people realize that there's a lot of room for innovation in the world of Magic, and I hope that you can see the innovations that we've made in this deck and try it out. Uh, there's a lot of people that won't enjoy playing a deck like this. It's it's very different, um, but if you have the stomach for it, I would highly recommend it. And overall, I just I was just impressed on every level with the deck, and also just how hard the deck was to play correctly. There was a lot of misplays that I made, and, uh, you know, that's just something that as you learn the deck and learn the interactions, you'll learn when to do things at different speeds and things like that. And you also see the, see the power of something, being able to cast things like Ulamog and Emrakul in your deck rather than, you know, relying on, on Marvel and instead of having Marvel be just a threat that you can play later in the game. So thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you guys all next time for another Wednesday Night Warrior. Don't forget to uh, support the content here on pure mtgo by going to mtgo traders you can also support uh go to my podcast check it out on constructive criticism it's a podcast about getting better at magic the gathering i also do one on limited called limited time only uh and we look forward to seeing you guys all on the constructive criticism youtube channel and uh, you can go to our patreon page at patreon.com ccmtg to see more awesome content thank you so much and have a wonderful day